Everybody, um, welcome. Um, Chalk B and Resolve Philly is so excited to have you here. This is such an important conversation on student mental health and gun violence. Um, my name is Samir Hampton, and I'm an 18 year old senior at George Washington Carver High School of Engineering and Science. Wow, that was a mouthful. Um, but yes, I'm happy to have you here. And I think that you know discussions like these are super important because. You know, violence is something that we do as humans when we're not listened to, when we're not seen, we're not heard, respected, valued, um, appreciated. And I think, you know, this recent booming in gun violence in Philadelphia is only a result of us, you know, not getting our basic human needs met, right? And in conversations like these are so important because we get to interact with each other and we get to see each other's you know, true needs and desires as human beings. And, you know, it's a level, it's a even playing field. And and I think conversations like these will actually help figure out, you know, how we can start mitigating um, these very, you know, tragic results of gun violence. Um, so now I'm going to um, sort of uh, also talk about like my personal journey. I, I know I'll, I'll go to um, Carver and, and in my sophomore year, we also, um, lost a, a, a member of our community to gun violence, and it was super traumatizing. Um, we, like, I didn't really know um, the person very well, but I have friends who did, and it was such a, just, uh, like, it, it was so interesting being in that experience, but it was also like we all got the space to mourn together. Um, but it was just so it was crazy just seeing my friends like literally cry and like break down in school and, and have to think about, you know, how they're not going to be able to see their friend again um, for the next few years. They won't be able to graduate, you know, with him. And I also have lost family members to gun violence. And, and I just think that, I think that it's, it's definitely start, it's definitely a time to start talking about it. I think, especially now with it being on a rise during the pandemic, it's, it's only a result of us, you know, like I said before, like really not being humanized. Like let's start, you know, vying each other as full complex human beings with stories. Um, and I think today is, a, is an amazing opportunity to be able to um, get to hear each other's stories. Um, yeah, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Johan, Johan Calhoun. I'm the Baruch Chief of Chalkbee Philadelphia. Um, Chalkbee also has published several stories um, and uh, works relating to gun violence and how, was in, how it impacts young people, um, their stories and their education. And you can also find these links in the chat if you want to check them out. Um, but yeah, thank you guys. All right, thank you so much, Samir. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Johan Calhoun. I'm the Bureau Chief for Chalkbeat Philadelphia. And I'm here as your moderator this evening for this important discussion. Uh, to document how gun violence is affecting students' academic performance and school's ability to fulfill their mission, uh, Chalkbeat began a series last year shedding light on district schools affecting the most by the city's gun violence and what the district is doing to help students deal with the trauma of intensified violence. The numbers are daunting. Last year, violence in Philadelphia reached historic levels, with the city surpassing 500 homicides, the highest number since 1990. Police statistics show that through mid-November of last year, over 30 fatal shooting victims were under the age of 18, more than all of 2020, and triple the number of 2015. And 30 people under the age of 18 were arrested for gun homicides six times more than 2019. Heading into just the middle of the fourth month of 2022, 
The city's police department is reporting 142 homicides with 96 fatal and non-fatal shooting victims being between the ages of 13 and 19 and 12 homicides for youth under the age of 18. Studies show there's a lack of support for students who experience violence and trauma, which can affect lifelong health and wellness, as well as academic performance. Signs that have a negative impact on student achievement brought on by outside violence include lower train of thought, aggressive behavior toward classmates, and chronic absenteeism. So let's introduce our speakers tonight. We have in alphabetical order, uh, Kevin Bethel, who is the Chief of Safety for Philadelphia Schools, uh, Selena Carrera, um, who is an educator at the Philadelphia Juvenile Justice Services Center. We have Lisa Christian, um, Anti-Violence Partnership of Philadelphia's Director of Counseling Services. We have Leondo Dunn, Principal of Mastery Simon Gratz High School. We have Armando Orte Ortez, a student at Northeast High School and student representative on the Philadelphia School Board. And then we have Aaron Gill Wilson, a student at Carver Engineering and Science High School and co-executive director of advocacy for Herb Ed Advocates. So let's get started. And we are going to start with the students first. Uh, but before that, we want to ask all of our attendees tonight that while you're listening to this program, um, to tweet your thoughts using the hashtag, um, hashtag PHL mental health. I want to remind everyone that this is a safe space and can be a very, and this can be a very heavy topic. If you feel the need to step away, um, please do so. Uh, we have some good people from Chalkbeat here in the chat to point you towards resources if you're looking for support or have any questions. So let's get started. Uh, the first question is for Aaron and Armando. As students, whose school communities have been affected by gun violence? How do you think schools in Philadelphia could better support students and their mental health following traumatic events in their communities? I can go first or it doesn't matter, um, either way, um, if Aaron wants to go. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go first. Um, the question they asked was, how can schools best spend precious resources, right? Um, and how um, does it make, how, what school communities have experienced this, right? Um, so my answer to the first question is that, um, before anything, I just wanna note that um, gun violence isn't just a school issue, um, it's a community issue. And, um, and I think, um, there has been like numerous accounts of how we make the city safer for students and prevent gun violence, right? But um, we have to understand that gun violence is um, sadly in like in a space that's kind of inevitable. Um, and I remember um, speak like speaking about this on um, uh, the board meeting about action item um, uh, action item uh, number fifteen is for certain schools where um, it's. Uh, uh, like a, a positive step to make students feeling safe getting out of school and going to school. And I think so that's a requirement. Um, the first thing I would want um, for resources would be um, counseling, um, trauma support for students and um, safety nets um, for students who experience this. Um, I feel like um, students uh, are like traumatized and like petrified to go to school or come back from school. Um, I'm gonna share a little anecdote um, of myself. Um, I have a cousin, um, she goes to San Diego Fells. Um, she gets picked up at 2.40. A fight arises, she hears a bullet flash, she cries. This type of violence is intensified and pervasive. Um, and I want to know, and I want everyone to know that um, everyone um, who does go through this is not um, the same. It's more like unique individual. Um, and she cries in the car as she hears the violence of guns. And the video um, pops out all over social media of the gun shooting. Um, I think so, like the thing is that, um, I think so the research that we should really have is like, um, like more support and like in our mental health because it's like really does affect a lot of people, like going to school, coming back from school, um, 
like certain communities because their parents might not be able to afford um, these supports. And I think so it should be within schools. And I think so um, in addition to that, the accessibility part um, and reaching out to communities about um, how we can support is the most important thing. Um, and I think that's one way we can fix it. Um, and that's my answer to your question, if Aaron wants to go. Could you repeat the first part of your question, please? You're on mute if you're speaking, I apologize. I'm sorry. Okay, as students whose school communities have been affected by gun violence, how do you think schools in Philadelphia could better support students and their mental health following traumatic events in their communities? Um, I think it should first be a level of addressing it and not pretending that it doesn't exist and that these students in the school communities are being impacted, aren't being impacted by it. So first addressing it and um, just letting them know, like as faculty and as staff, like we see you and we hear what you're going through and we like you're seen, your feelings are validated, you're heard. Um, experiencing gun violence and then just going to school and just jumping back into schoolwork and being bombarded and overwhelmed with like assignments and stuff like that, it shouldn't just be a thing. Like it should just be a level of you coming back to school, you coming back to a community of people. It doesn't feel like a community. Once you are, once you experience gun violence in your family and your friend group and any group that you're in, and then you go back to school, school should be a community. It should be a Yes, it's a, a level of education, like you're being educated there, but it should still be, you should still feel love, you should still feel seen and heard, especially being as though we live in Philadelphia and it's a state of emergency right now. The gun violence rates are horrible, as y'all all may know. And so, like I said, it should just be some awareness about it. Um, and then I believe this was already mentioned, but like safety nets, counseling, definitely. Um, mental health should be seen and heard always. Um, yeah, so just conversations and not trying to avoid it. Like I understand as a teacher or as like a staff or faculty or anything like that, it may, you may not wanna open up or create some uncomfortable conversations amongst yourself and your students. And it should like, I don't, uncomfortable conversations have to happen, like gun violence and losing someone is uncomfortable. You are in an uncomfortable situation. So just jumping back into schoolwork, being as though your teachers are uncomfortable having these conversations, which you shouldn't be a thing. You're already uncomfortable. So just having a conversation and expressing how you feel should be where the next steps align. Okay, and that level of support and to answer um, Cecilia's question in the chat, what does support mean? Uh, we are talking about res resources. Um, so what you were saying, Aaron, so not only do we need to provide support and resources for students, but teachers as well, correct? Yes, correct. Good. So let's move on to uh, Chief Bethel as well as Selena um, from Samantha in the audience. Uh, what can schools in the District of Philadelphia be doing right now to help its students and educators heal from the trauma of gun violence? Yeah, you know, first, let me let me recognize our young students here. I mean, you know, one thing is key is this, this youth voice. So I want to be, you know, Johanna, I mean, obviously, I, I'm coming from the safety spurs, and there's obviously uh, other individuals who are, are better representative of the student support services. Um, but, you know, as you know, you know, I mean, there is a lot of the work being done in the school district, even before my team gets involved with bringing the police department, creating these safety zones and these safe paths that we may talk about later. And so I'd be remiss if we didn't really recognize that, you know, through this, the school district, you know, they have introduced, you know, uh, uh, the programming under the student supports around, you know, relationship first and, and really starting to, in, in, you know, and again, I don't want to speak out of turn because there's probably folks on this listing audience who are better at this who are run that section, but, you know, to name it though, right, that they're doing their relationship first work that really works around repairing, you know, the harm and a restorative justice approach. You know, there is work by, the, you know, you know, the team, Dr. Jamie Banks and the team around trauma and really started to introduce the trauma informed approach into the space. 
Um, and, and so that work really in the positive behavior interventions and supports, all of that stuff, that all of that is important, as you know, Johan, because, and then at the end of the day, we have to start working upstream, right? We have to start teaching our young people how to deal with conflict. And then that conflict should not result in violence and guns, right? And so, you know, we keep trying to avoid the prevention and intervention space and understanding how trauma impacts our young people in this space in a significant way. I mean, right now, I mean, do you raise those, you learned those statistics, but every day when we get those, those incidents that are coming into the school district where we have a child who's been, who's been shot or, or been murdered or even been result of a significant incident, we, we get that information in my office and we immediately send that over to the respective school leaders, particularly the Office of Student Support, where that activates, you know, the Dr. Banks team and their trauma response team to go to those schools, right? To reach out to those families, to touch those families and start to provide that trauma support that there's gonna be needed for those families to get through that crisis. And so, so there, there is a myriad of, and I can go through a whole plethora of programs that are being in, instituted in the department. And more importantly, in, in our work in the Office of School Safety, we really have started to lean into our restorative work. Uh, how do we are more working more effectively through our mentoring uh, with our young people? We have multiple mentoring programs going now. We're even in the juvenile detention center now, mentoring with those young people, I mean, with our school safety officers to try to get upstream to hopefully we can we can move them away from that and working with the school supports transition team. You know, we have a mentor at one of our schools in Martin Luther King, in which we're working with the you know Dr. Bonds and the team in there, where we're mentoring those folks coming back from placement to, to work with them because we know they have a high propensity. So there's a collective all hands on approach, and I'm not even doing it justice of the work the school district is really trying to put forward you know, to meet to meet the needs of our kids. And because this is not normal. You know, what our kids are being to exposed to, what our school leaders are being exposed to is not normal. And we have allowed this to get normalized in our space. And that's just not acceptable. Uh, Selena, if you can um, add to that, you know, I interviewed you and checked out the operation at the Youth Study Center. So you have seen this trauma firsthand. Uh, yeah. What can the district do? What what can the city do to help you guys out? Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of things that need to happen. Um, <laughs> but I'll I'll try to sketch the surface first. Um, I want to say I, I completely agree with Erin and Armando. Like, um, there needs to be more support in humanizing these experiences. Um, I've seen sometimes people like uh like Aaron described like it'll be so uncomfortable that teachers will just try to avoid it right and just go straight into school or go right into class and what happens when those things get ignored is that it just goes down it doesn't go anywhere and then it might come up in an abrupt way so I think um you know what we've been able to do at the school district and you know I was recruited from Los Angeles I'm from Philadelphia originally but I've done a lot of work with um at-risk youth, youth that have been incarcerated, youth that have been in different systems. Um, and we've had a hand in reducing the recidivism rates and helping with some of those violence in Los Angeles. And I think the biggest key and what I've seen that has been helpful where I'm at is giving that space that the kids are, I mean, the young people that are on the call today described is giving that space to, to process what is happening around them. Um, a lot, I work at the juvenile justice center, a lot of the kids that are incarcerated or some kids that do come through there are for gun violence and things of that nature. And the one main thing I hear from majority of my students is that they're not carrying around a gun to carry around a gun. A lot of times it's for safety. It's because they don't feel safe having to go from one neighborhood to a different neighborhood to go to school if they get in, accepted into a good school, but it's far. They got to think about coming home at night or going down the wrong street or going down the wrong block and things like that. And if we don't even acknowledge that it's happening, then how can you fix a problem that you don't see, right? And people are talking about gun violence, gun violence. It is a community issue. I think there needs to be more socio-emotional transformative practices and not in terms of like just teaching ways. Like I think we need to help our young people. And I'm, I'm speaking as being a young person as well, you know, growing up around things that have been desensitized and normalized for a very long time. You know, I grew up in the 2000s and the same issues then are the issues now, but extremely more intensified. And it, I think there needs to be 
more wraparound services. Um, I think there needs to be mentorship that starts from within the placements and within the juvenile justice center with people, when you could build a rapport with someone inside that knows your situation, that's been there with you um, through your process, and then you can connect with that person on the outs. And then that person, uh, you can, there's already a built trust for that person that can introduce you to programs, introduce you to mentorship and different natures of, of that aspects. I think that could be very helpful in terms of kids coming out of placement. Um, in terms of like just kids in school, I, I honestly think that there needs to be like a day just dedicated to mental health and how to deal with these conflicts and how to deal with um, tension or anger in a way that serves you or the way that can serve a community instead of destroy a community. Um, there needs to be a lot more stepping up in that way. And I don't think it's, um, you know, just from city officials, it needs to be done from people in the community needs their voices heard. There's a, a lot of people that can know what to do, but if not given the proper resources to do so, we rely on systems that aren't really necessarily getting the job done. So, um, you know, I, I, in my classroom, like we do socio-emotional transformation through creative writing and music. And I know people be like, oh, it's just music, but it's not. It's a form of expression. It's a way of getting out your story. It's a way of of connecting with others and finding resilience and power and um, dignity through your story in a way that can be celebrated and upheld. And um, if we're too busy policing our kids instead of listening to our kids, then they're not gonna be open to opening up. They're, they're not gonna feel like it's a safe space to even speak their truth if they have to worry about that truth being used against them. So I think there needs to be more space for conversations to be had. There needs to be more representation and inclusivity with people from the neighborhood in those positions, um, even in education. So, you know, at, at my school, I, I commend my principal, my, my principal, Dina Ramsey, she's done such a beautiful job at really handpicking people to be in those spaces that can really do the work that needs to be done. However, even still, um, you know, I'm one of two Latinos on the, on the faculty, right? I could name maybe on one, or one hand um, the number of teachers of color that are in the space or from the community or have um, exper experience in dealing with these kind of issues and traumas. And I think, you know, even if it's if it's not in necessarily like your ethnicity, but you know, there needs to be teachers that know about gun violence that may have grew up in those type of environments, or teachers that know how to deal with broken homes because they came from one and they were able to rise above. Like there needs to be more of that, and I think there needs to be a more of an intergenerational step in, right? I'm 35. My kids are like, Miss, you're not 22, and it cracks me up. But there needs to be more younger people, I think, that can relate better uh, to the younger folks that can kind of help with connecting them to, you know, the older people or the elders in the community that have been there and done that and can really give so much good feedback and so much good advice. Um, but sometimes just because there's no intergenerational connect, sometimes that can get lost in translation, if, if that makes sense. But um, those are just some of my thoughts and more programs and things that the kids are interested in that can really help them properly understand what they're feeling and how to deal with that. That's my, my two cents. I think that's a perfect segue to bring in um, Lisa. Um, Lisa, what Selena just mentioned there. Uh, but let me ask this question for students, parents, and teachers on this call who have experienced traumatic events but feel like they don't have resources or safe places to go, what resources are available to them right now? Um, where can they go for support? Thank you for the question. And first, before I dive in, I just wanna thank Armando and Aaron and all of the panelists. Um, I really appreciate all of you being here um, because this conversation is crucial. Um, to how we're going to move forward um, with our schools and with our school communities. Um, Real-time resources, I'm going to be perfectly honest, are becoming harder and harder to come by because the resources, particularly mental health resources, 
are overly um, saturated with clients as a result of the gun violence epidemic. There are very few resources that I know of in the city that does not have a wait list at this time. And that's an issue. It is an issue when night after night, we know that the homicide and the shooting rates are increasing. But when people need to be able to reach out, there are very few mental health resources that can see people immediately. I, I just wanna be perfectly honest about that. The other thing that I, I would like to say is, you know, AVP, Anti-Violence Partnership of Philadelphia, we provide counseling around trauma specific issues, not just gun violence, but all, any kind of violence, sexual assault, um, robberies, home invasions, all those kinds of issues we address as well. But the majority of the things that we are seeing are definitely related to shootings and to gun violence. The other resource that I could tell you about is what's called the hub. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Philadelphia hub. Um, the hub meets every Monday and the hub is under um, Marla, Marla Bellamy Davis at uh, Philadelphia Ceasefire. If any of you are interested in participating in the hub, we meet every Monday at 11 o'clock, whether there's a holiday or not. The hub meets specifically to address issues that people have with individuals and or families. It doesn't have to necessarily be about shooting. It could be any issue that people need extra help and support around. The, the purpose of the hub is to provide additional supports by varied, um, by varied disciplines around the city. Juvenile justice is there. Department of Human Services is there, are there. Um, the school district is represented there. There are a number of providers that are there that can provide real-time support and assistance. Um, and I know, um, thank you, Mr. Dunn, um, Dr. Dunn for being on the call. I used to work at Grants for years. Um, and I know that they have a representative um, that, that attends meetings on the hub. Um, so thank you very much for that. I can also let you know that PAN, um, Philadelphia Anti-Drug, Anti-Violence Network, um, our violence interrupter programs, such as PAN, um, I know that Philadelphia Ceasefire works in school. They provide real-time support. They provide a lot of help um, once they're given information about the potential for retaliatory violence in particular any kind of violence issues that are going on in the community, they have the ability to go in and meet with and talk with either in the homes, at the community recreation centers, whatever site they need to go to, they have the ability to do that in real time to help mitigate some of these issues that are going on. Um, I also wanna um, give a shout out to other programs, arts programs, um, such as um, the Village of Arts and Humanities located in Germantown. The Love Care Project, which is a mentor, mentorship program. Center for Grieving Children and Families, formerly known, formerly known as Center for Grieving Children and Families, Uplift. They provide groups for individuals, families who are dealing with these kinds of issues. Um, another program is, uh, I wrote it down. Just give me one second. Let me just make sure I'm covering everything. Oh, I can't forget um, the availability of our recreation centers. We need to have community-based interventions and rec through our recreation centers, through PAL. All of these centers and even the, the libraries that have been closed, we need to have all of these resources centralized in our communities for to have safe spaces for our youth to access. Another counseling resource is Children's Crisis Treatment Center. 
But again, they have a wait list as well. If people really need to get a hold of counseling services in the, in the more immediate without, without having to go through or be on a wait list, if you have health coverage, what I encourage people to do is to locate that member that, or that customer services number on the back of your medical card if you have insurance. Contact that number and let them know that you need uh, trauma therapy or you wanna speak with a trauma therapist. That will sometimes get you services a lot quicker than going through our community-based mental health programs or AVP. Um, there's also EMIR Healing Center, which offers groups. Mothers in Charge offers groups to anyone who are co-victims of homicide. Uh, and, uh, thank, thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, and FYI to um, the people in the audience, as well as our guests, we do plan to share these bullet points with the new superintendent coming on board, um, including those suggestions, Lisa. Um, so thank you so much. Um, moving on, I, you know, before I make this brief introduction, I wanna say that I'm so happy to have Principal Dunn here because what's happening in our community is also affecting students at charter schools, not just neighborhood or district schools. Um, so, uh, you know, this next question is for Principal Dunn. You know, when we last talked, um, I'll say about almost two months ago uh, and reviewed some cases that have happened at Simon Gratz where students fell to gun violence. Uh, majority of those students were black males and taking a look at the youth homicide numbers across the city, black and Latino males make up a, make up a significant portion of these cases as victims and as suspects. Um, sociologists blame unemployment access to, to guns, um, lack of mentoring and support as factors. Um, in your position as principal at Simon Gratz, what do you see happening with this particular group of students? What programs, mentorship opportunities or efforts have you brought in to Simon Gratz to reach this particular group of students? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for that question, Johan. And to Armando and Aaron, thank you for being here and lending your voices. You guys are our futures and I appreciate and am fortunate to occupy this space with you this afternoon. What I will tell you all is that um, I've been at grads now for the past five years. Um, and I reached a point um, in my tenure here at Gratz in which I no longer wanted to focus my efforts and energy in supporting our students, staff and school community in the wake of a tragic incident. Um, and, and the question I ask to anyone who I'm able to sit down and have a conversation with, uh, whether you are a student, parent, family member, um, is that at the end of the day, elected official, can we say to our youth right now, the young people that we're educating, the young people that will be our future, that we did everything that we could to protect their lives and show them that they are valued and give them opportunities and resources to escape and not be involved in those situations. Um, and I think, you know, specifically at Gratz, were we doing everything we could? No. And are we doing everything that we can now? Um, not yet, but we are doing, we are doing a lot and we are taking innovative approaches to support our students. Um, specifically, when you asked me what programs have we started at Gratz, I will tell you that we are working with a significant amount of organizations. We are regularly connecting with the police. Uh, we're working with AVP and I appreciate uh, Lisa Christian and how available her organization has been to us to support students. Um, we are working with uh, other organizations um, such as we have contracted a therapy and counseling group. Uh, we set aside significant resources in our budget so that all of our staff members can have access to therapy and supports at no cost to them even though they already have insurance and benefits and they can get access to those therapy and supports during the school day. So they have no barriers to accessing those things. Specifically for our students, we started a program here at grads called Rebound. Um, and that program is working with our most vulnerable student population 
students who have high absenteeism, students who are passing a low amount of classes, uh, students who have a history of being a perpetrator of gun violence or being impacted by gun violence. Um, we're giving those students access to a few things. They have a mentor and a violence interrupter. And so anytime during the day, it could be 2 a.m. at night or it could be 5 p.m. in the afternoon, if a young person finds themselves escalated, there is a trusted adult that they can call and talk to who will go to their home and their house to support them in not making bad decisions or not being around people who are making bad decisions. Those young people are getting regular access to counseling and therapy. We are making sure that those young people have a job and are regularly participating in a community, um, in a after-school enrichment program. And we are also exposing young people um, to things they wouldn't have ordinarily been exposed to, like taking trips to Washington, D.C., New York City, uh, going to plays, et cetera, uh, because so many students um, that I educate in this building have not left um, their neighborhoods, their communities for majority of their lives. And so we started off that pilot with 15 young people. We are now supporting 50 young people uh, and we hope to be able to support more young people. But I think the thing that we have to realize is that in order to support those young people, it takes a significant amount of resources. And we can't assign 50, 60, 100 young people to one adult because there is only so much they can do and they can only be at one house when the emergency comes up. And so we need to have more dedicated young people. The last thing that I wanna mention in my time is that we don't talk about it enough in terms of how far reaching the impacts of gun violence are. And so at Gratz, you know, my students in my com community has been dis uh, impacted disproportionately compared to other schools and communities throughout the district and the city. But what I will also tell you, the thing that we don't talk about is that my students have cousins and friends who attend other schools. And so when a student in my building is impacted by gun violence, there are also students at other schools who are impacted by gun violence. Or a student in my building may be the perpetrator of gun violence for a student in another building. And so this is not an issue that's only impacting my building. It's impacting everyone that lives in the city. And so we all need to work together collaboratively so that we can move forward this issue. So let me back up with that question, the first part of the question. Um, as principal coming to school, what do you see um, Black and Latino male students? What's the problem here? What, what are some issues that you are seeing? Yeah, I, I will tell you um, that Black and Brown students uh, are often um, viewed out as a monolith, that they all have the same experiences, the same aspirations, likes, lived experiences. And I'll tell you that that's not true. Um, what I am seeing though, is young people navigating a community that has been historically underserved, overlooked, overpromised, and those promises have not been delivered. Um, and so I can tell you, I'm seeing, you know, young people who do not know how to appropriately navigate conflict when an issue arises. Um, if I could wave a magic wand, I would delete Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever it is tomorrow, because there is so much conflict that is taking, that is bubbling up in those spaces. And those spaces are unmonitored and, un, you know, and anyone can do anything and say anything whenever they want. Um, I will also tell you that there's food insecurity. There are neighborhoods in the city that are incredibly hot because there are no trees. Um, there are neighborhoods in the city that when you call the police, the police don't show up. And I know it's not because the police don't care. I believe that the system is incredibly overworked. And so when you are a young person or a parent and you find yourself in a situation that when you call 911, there is no one that is responding to that call, then what are you left to do? You are left to defend that issue on your own. And so there are a myriad of issues impacting young people. And I will tell you that I regularly encounter young people that reach inflection points in their lives. And Principal Dunn, do I drop out of school today? Do I continue coming to school? And I will tell you that I wish that every young person in the city had a trusted adult that they could go to to support them with those decisions. But unfortunately that they don't. And so many of those young people make those decisions by themselves.
Um, and I just want to add on. So as everyone was speaking, I was just making some mental notes about everything. So it was mentioned that there are very few mental health resources. And one, this is a problem. And just because it's few doesn't mean that there are there aren't any available. So the ones that are available, it is amazing. And there needs to be more awareness about it. Just having some mental resources available here and there isn't enough. Like there needs to be awareness in schools. I can like my peers, my classmates and in other schools and communities as well. They don't know about these resources. It needs to be a showcase of everything available to them, whether it's the gun violence prevention programs, it's the mentorship programs, whatever it is, there needs to be more awareness about it. Due to um, last year, I, I remember around like COVID, bef uh, yeah, the end of COVID and like December of 2020, I realized that I could not find any mental health resources or like any mentorship programs, anything like that. So I decided to start one of my own, which is what I'm here representing my own nonprofit organization, Mentally E. And it's, it's good that I did start this, but it's a shame that I could not find any, and my peers couldn't find any. And so um, I do thank you, Principal, for the Rebound program. It is amazing. And I do thank you for acknowledging that just because your school is the school who is being most affected and the rest of the schools that there are cousins of those victims and stuff like that in other school communities who are being impacted as well. So this program should be something, and I have a, my suggestion is that this program should be something that is, um, that is implemented school-wide, like in a school district-wide, this should be something that is going on in all school communities. Aside from that, um, I know in my school, I go to Carver Engineering and Science on Temple's campus in North Philadelphia. And I know we have metal detectors at my school. We even have like a gun or weapon drop box at my school. However, there wasn't like, it's just a box there. There isn't, there's never any information on what this box is, what this box is here for or anything like that. So it needs to like more conversations needs to happen and not just metal detectors being put in place and weapon drop box putting like is in more conversations need to happen. Also, it was mentioned that these weapons are people don't just carry guns around them to look cool or for the latest Instagram picture or something like that. It's a level of protection. There are people who don't even want to go to certain events or certain places if they know they cannot have a weapon with them or something like that because they don't feel comfortable and they don't feel protected in those places. And that shouldn't be like that. This is not normal. This is not something that should be normalized. But when you hear things like the weather breaking, as in last week over spring break, the weather broke and over 24 people getting shot and schools aren't addressing it to their school community as if this is something normal, it creates a level of more normalizing. Like it's is becoming normal to us like we're numb to it because it keeps happening no one is addressing it so that is an issue in itself the gun violence the homicide rates needs to be addressed because it's no longer it's not people who are older than us that are doing most of the killing most of the killing comes from people in my age group so we, it needs to be a level of figuring out why is this happening, the root of everything going on. And honestly, in my opinion, I think it some of it comes from, not all of it, but some of it may come from jealousy. And I know that food insecurities was mentioned and stuff like that as well. So financial, like it goes all into financial things and stuff like that too. And there need, it just needs to be a like broadcast of like more opportunities for them. Um, and I know, uh, principal, you did mention the college tours and stuff like that. Like people need to know, not people, my student, the students, my peers, my classmates, we all need to know about different colleges. We need to know about different ways of living. It's more to life than just Philadelphia. No one, it's like, it's so shocking and it's like heartbreaking that most of my peers that I'm around and people in my school community, other school communities don't under, don't even know what certain colleges are, don't know what many different majors they can go into. They don't know this because we aren't being told this. We need to be told this. We need to understand that it's more to life than just Philadelphia, than just normalizing gun rates, than just normalizing us losing our friends and then going back to school and having to complete papers on top of papers. Like we're losing our friends, we're losing our family. 
and we're going back to school acting like it's normal and it's not being addressed. It is a problem. It needs to be addressed and it is not normal. So that's all I wanted to say. If, if I, can I add on to that too? If that's cool. Erin and, and, and Principal Dunn, thank you guys both. You guys hit it on the head. Um, Principal Dunn, I love that program that you're talking about is, I think that's amazing. And I think like that was something um, I was kind of like trying to hint towards, like there needs to be some type of mentorship program. Like um, I have to say his name, I, I lost a recent student. Um, and because of where I work at, I lose students a lot, but this student, Zaim Terrell Hartman, um, in the news, you know, he was demonized and I'm not trying to justify what he did, but he was one of my closest students. He was a gentle giant. He was such a, a beautiful soul. And because of his mental health and because of something that was going on, it resulted in him losing it, you know, and resulting in gun violence. And he was killed by the police. He was just turned 18. And if he would have had a mentor, if he could have had someone to call in that moment of distress, uh, because his uncle was dying that raised him and he didn't know how to deal with that emotional stress and you know it's not like I'm there or he's in my class anymore or he had somebody with him if he had someone he could have called that could have prevented him from being killed that could have saved his life that could have helped him go on because he was trying to make a transformation and trying to make a change and his life was so important and it mattered so much and so many of our kids that we lose their lives matter so much they just don't know how to deal with what they're going through and um you know, I just, I'm really grateful for Armando and Erin on this call to be those voices because everything they're saying is spot on and is so important and it is so true. Um, Pr Principal Dunn, like, thank you for what you're doing at your charter school. I, I think that mentorship program that you can call at any moment, that needs to be in every single school in Philadelphia, point blank period, because it's so much other things going on outside of the school. How can a kid focus on getting all this work done as our students are describing if they're experiencing PTSD, if they're getting flashbacks of violence, if they can just anything, it, it's, it's a lot to bear. And there needs to be more things that can allow them to process and talk about and have a voice with what they're going through. Um, I have a program that I implemented at this Philadelphia Juvenile Justice uh, School Center. It may not be the overall answer, but I think it's something that can add into the help. Um, you guys saw the kids that were there when we did the interview and it, it's, it has impacted and been helpful, but I think it's not just, you know, it's not just arts and music programs, it's collaboration, right? It's every hand on deck, it's, it's expression, it's art, it's music, it's jobs, it's uh, learning how to deal with conflict, it's learning how to have conflict and be okay with conflict in a restorative way. There's so many things that need to be done. And even if you're, I saw a couple comments in the a couple questions that was saying like, well, I don't fit into any of those things. So how can I help? Just creating a space. Say, hey, there's some heavy things going on. If you guys need to talk about it, let's make a circle. Let's make a affirmation circle. Let's make a um, dedication. Who do we want to dedicate this to? I, even if it's 10 minutes of journaling at the end of class, whatever, like those things are so much more important than we realize. And once we start making um, mental health for our students as important of, as the academic databases, right, that are in place, I think we'll see not only a lot more healing and transformation in our community, but we will see that in the schools as well. For, for time's sake, we're going to move on to the last question before we go to the Q&A. Um, and this question is for Chief Bethel. Um, the Safe Corridors Initiative has been around for years. Um, the district and the city police um, have discussed how best to use the Safe Corridors program, in which volunteers provide extra supervision for students walking to and from school, similar to a neighborhood watch. Um, but we have um, Juan Carlos Roble, Corona, and I hope I pronounced his name correctly, 15-year-old um, student at Tanner Duckery who was gunned down at 2.40 p.m. Um, near his school and his home. Do you know if there were any safe corridors volunteers on site during the time of Juan's death? And if you can give us like an update on how this program is doing um, now and helping students get to school and back home safely. 
Yeah, so Johan, and, and, and um, no, there was not uh, a, a safe corridor. He was on his block, actually, uh, when he was killed. He was not even just several doors from his doorstep. And so there, there was not a, a safety corridor. Uh, and, and you know, the majority of our corridors rely on community volunteers. And so when, the, when there's this conversation around, you know, who needs to be stepping up, we, we've constantly challenged uh, those in the community to, to reach out to the city uh, in their, their program to support, you know, putting out the corridors in, in those areas. As it relates to our work, because we felt there was a gap in, in, in how to get folks out the corridor, we, we adopted a model uh, based out of Chicago. And so we created the Office of School Safety Safe Path Program. Um, Dr. Height has been uh, really uh, supported us to be able to give us uh, funding. We also got a grant from PCCD. And we just recently uh, brought on a vendor, the Institute for Development of African American Youth, IDA, uh, that will now is going through the process of hiring uh, individuals. We'll be putting uh, individuals on the corridors uh, in eight of our schools. Uh, we're starting, you know, most of them are our high schools where we have as they leave uh, through that, that through those corridors. Um, and they will get paid to be in those corridors. They will be individuals from the community who support the community. Um, just an update, Johan, we're, we are in the final stages of them bringing on the staff. We hope to have that, uh, those programs starting to launch by the end of April, early May, and that will be carried on uh, for the next uh, three years. And we hope as we gather more partners in this process that we'll be able to expand uh, those corridors. You're, you're muted, I didn't. Okay, before we close out, this question is a lightning round for everyone. Um, if you could ask school leaders in Philadelphia to do one thing, just one thing to better help students heal from violence in their communities, what would it be? And we can start in alphabetical order. Uh, let's go with um, Chief Bethel. Sorry, give me the question one more time, Johan. If we would ask for what? Oh, lost my question. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you could ask school leaders in Philadelphia to do one thing, um, just one thing to better help students heal from violence in their communities, what would it be? Well, I'm, I'm part of the school leadership, uh, uh, but I mean, I, I think it's just really to continue the work. I mean, there is a lot of work and I didn't do it justice here uh, from our support services around the social most uh, work that's going on, the trauma-informed training is going on, the mentoring work we're doing. And I just think we need to continue that there is no gas pump or no brake pad that we have to have a full, full port press and keep our foot on the gas. Yeah, you know I mean, because our, our children need us, our school community needs us, our school leaders need us. Yeah, you know I mean, it, it is a collective effort. Okay, let's go with Selena. Can you repeat the question? I was, I was about to type in the chat. <laughs> uh, what is the one thing to better help students heal from violence in their communities? If you could ask school leaders to do one thing. Um, I really think having a mental health day once a week. I know somebody's put once a month, but I think at this rate, like it needs to be once a week, maybe like on a Wednesday or a Monday and a Friday where it's a half day, but there needs to be more specific, um, intentional time around trauma and in a way where the conversation can be held and had, whether that's with a third party, whether that's with community leaders that are involved within the school, um, maybe not just the t a teacher that, you know, because there's a lot of teachers that may not be from Philly that are teaching in Philly, that have never lived in a city, that are working in a city, and, and they want to help, and they just don't know how to help, right? So we need more of those type of staff in the schools that can, um, you know, hold those conversations or at least lead them in so that the kids can have time together to really feel what they need to feel and process it and learn new ways where they can process it and it can serve them. I think that's really important. And I think that mentorship program that Principal Dunn has started is something that if a young person has someone they can, they really trust it and they can call at one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, five, you know, when things are going down, I think that's really, really important. I think those are things that could that could definitely help. Okay, Lisa. And our programs. All right, I'm done. Um, I think that 
we need training around trauma, not just on the school level, but on the community level. Many of our communities, our churches, our all of our faith-based communities and leaders, all of us have to work in collaboration. And that's the key. We have to do this in a collaborative, inclusive, um, and, and, and supportive manner where everyone can start at a baseline with understanding what trauma is and what it isn't. Because we, we lump everything trauma. Everything now is trauma. And although trauma is playing a huge and significant role, we also have to understand how trauma contributes to depression, how it contributes to anxiety issues, how it contributes to drug and alcohol and other high risk taking behaviors. We need to be able to start on a community level and include everyone in the community. Schools are the largest institutions in this country that serve youth. We're not doing a really good job of using schools as safe spaces for all of our families to be able to have access to. We need to rethink how we are strategizing and how and critically look at how we are using spaces, how we are using, and, and I can appreciate Doctors Dunn, Dr. Dunn's viewpoint about social media, but we also need to understand that we can also use social media at our advantage. We could be using social media to be able to provide avenues for kids to reach out and have resources. We, we, we demonize social media, but we know that the majority of our youth are on social media. We need to find collaborative ways to be able to reach youth at the, at the avenues and the points where they are at. Social media is not going anywhere. Let's use it to our advantage. And, and the other thing that I would say is, you know, all of our youth are at risk. You know, I, I really want to do pushback with how we are defining youth who need supports and youth who don't. All of our youth need support, every one of them. And we need to be able to give messages of inclusion and include everybody in the community and stop you know, thinking that, well, trauma is only impacting this particular student and that particular, that particular student. Trauma is impacting all of us. And, and we need to have a universal approach to how we are dealing with how we are um, conceptualizing how we're going to move forward. And one thing that I put in the chat that I really appreciate Aaron and I appreciate Selena for, for suggesting, we need youth advisory committees and panels or councils, what, however you want to define it. We need those voices to be able to shape, to be able to instruct us as to how best to reach them. We have to have a community level intervention and input that is going to be specific to region to region. What folks do in South Philly and what the culture is in South Philly is very different in some respects than what happens in North Philly. We need to be able to understand the culture in which violence is taking place. We need to be able to understand the culture in which and, and, and how we are reaching people and do it in a way that is going to be proactive, that can be safe. We need safe spaces just to have conversation. And I'll stop there because I know we're short on time. You're on mute. Yes, so Principal Dunn, Armando, and Aaron, if you can keep your lightning round answers um, kind of short because we do have a special guest and superintendent, um, Dr. Hyde. Uh, so Principal Dunn, can you answer that question? I'm gonna give it to you in 30 seconds. And so we were speaking about mental health and I just wanna give a quick example of how um, gun violence has impacted our community. So as a principal, if I'm late for a meeting, I like to be on time. And so if I'm walking down the hallway swiftly, 
I'm stopped by students and staff. Principal Dunn, everything okay? What has happened? Nothing's happened. I'm just late for this meeting and I'm rushing there. And I think like that's a very tangible example around like how people are impacted, PTSD, et cetera. But to specifically answer this question, I think we need to bring intentionality to everything that we do for our young people. We have data. We know which neighborhoods, which zip codes. We know what happens when we don't act. We know that this upcoming school year, students are going to ask us for support. And when a student raises their hand and says, Principal Dunn, I need help, what is going to be my response to that young person? When a student raises their hand and says, Principal Dunn, I need a job, what is going to be my response to that young person? When a student raises their hand and says, Principal Dunn, I don't have a safe way to or from school, what is going to be my response? And not just me, the folks on this call, the leaders in the city, we need to bring intentionality to all our work because we can already anticipate what some of those questions, needs, requests, responses are gonna be from students and families. That was about 45 seconds, Johan, I'm sorry. You're good. Armando. Um, I agree with everyone with what they said. Um, I think so, whoever said that, we should look at where does it derive from, where does gun violence derive from, which is the most important thing. Um, and I also believe that mental health is imperative. I think so we need to have mental health um, supports. Uh, to even like be successful, right? Uh, to even get up from the morning, um, et cetera, right? I think so mental health is like, like that shouldn't be an argument. I think so it needs to be um, supported. Um, when talking about um, gun violence, I think so the most important thing that we should do is look at the correlation and causation of gun violence and like how does it correlate to certain groups and how does it um, target other groups, right? And then the causation of gun violence, like as to... Um, what um, Ms. Carrera said about students not feeling safe um, transporting in and out of school, so that's why they bring a gun, right? So that's an example, a tangible example of why um, this might occur if a person who has a gun who doesn't feel safe gets mugged by a couple people, that's where it starts, right? So I think so we should look at the causation and like why are these like issues so apparent and like where does it come from? Um, and I think so all schools should um, also have co um, cultural competent staff um what i mean by that is like having staff of um who have experienced this or who are um people of color and they might like the students who are people of color will feel more comfortable and more like um more uh, easily to um speak on um about this issue right because it may not be a comfortable for like a person who might be latino or um, African-American to speak to this, to a white person or a person who hasn't experienced this, right? So I think so, um, we should have comfortable space and inclusiveness about this. Um, and I know um, the district is um, trying to work for this. Um, an example is through like, uh, as to what um, I believe Principal Dunn said, the data that is um, shown, right? Through the progress monitoring, right? The on-track and off-track schools and what counseling supports do they need, right? So I think so the school district is, but the only thing that they're not doing is really doing the communication aspect of this. I think so there should be communication um, to everyone um, and how we can like really resolve this. And it is a community thing, not just a school thing. So everyone has to be in this tight together and like really um, striving to make a change. That's what I think. I don't know if anyone agrees with me or not. Aaron? Um, I agree with what everyone said. I think there needs to be like, yes, there needs to be more conflict resolution programs and mentorship programs, but there also needs to be an explanation of why these programs are needed. So if there is conflict resolution programs put in a place and there is an information spread about the program, how will people know, like, how will uh, one of my peers know, like, I need to be in this program. This is what I need to stop the gun violence from rising in my city. How do they know, like, is what they need? So I feel that more information needs to be spread on why it is important. And I also have um, that we should be included. We should be heard um, when data is being recorded. We It needs to be it needs to come from us, how it needs to come from us, it needs to come from parents, it needs to come from those who are around those who the victims of gun violence and the families of gun violence. So serving us cannot happen if you don't know our needs, if you aren't hearing us. So that's what I had to say. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thanks, Aaron. 
Uh, so before we close out, um, I would like to bring in a special guest. Um, I'd like to introduce to the audience, um, Dr. William Height, who is the current school superintendent. And he has served our school district for almost 10 years now and is soon to leave his post. Uh, so Dr. Height, first, thank you for joining us today and listening to the discussion. Uh, you have spearheaded many initiatives that were centered around Black and Latino male student achievement, expanding an initiative uh, pairing Black students with safety officers and making a push to get this demographic through college. Um, with that, can you give us your thoughts about what you heard tonight from this discussion and what more needs to be done to help save Philly students after you leave your office? Yeah, thank you, Johan, and thanks to Chalkbeat for putting this together. And also want to thank Amando and Aaron. I know everyone have talked about these two young people who are examples of the many young people that we serve in the district. Um, and thanks to Principal Dunn. And Principal Dunn, unfortunately, has had to deal with a lot of these incidents. Um, and I think other than uh, Selena, uh, I mean, and, and where Selena works, uh, probably uh, Gratz has had one of the highest numbers of children who've been, young people who've been impacted uh, by gun violence. Also wanna thank Lisa and, and thank you for the work that, that you do. And naturally, um, Chief Bethel, thank you for all of, all of the work that you've done. So I heard a lot of things, Johan, on, on this issue. And so one thing I think that, I wanna go to something Aaron said earlier. And, and I think this thing is critically important. And here's why it's critically important. Because every problem that we've been able to solve, we've been able to solve with the guidance, direction, voice, agency, advocacy from our young people. And so understanding what they need, understanding what um, they desire, understanding what in fact, or how they see an issue and how that issue is specific to their particular community or their particular school, I think is extremely important. And so one thing that, that Aaron said earlier was that like when these events happen and individuals then go off to the one place where many of the children still feel safe um, and for many of their young people feel the safest and they go off to schools, but then they are not allowed to talk about their emotions or the trauma or what has happened, I think is a disservice. And I think that we, we as educators, we as the school district, we as anyone who is standing in front of a child needs to be able to be willing to learn, learn how to have difficult conversations around what young people are experiencing. Um, and this, this notion of ensuring that they are heard, ensuring that um, we have the, we are responsive, that we're humanizing these issues and not acting like it's school or it's English or it's chemistry or it's geometry or it's science. And so therefore we can't talk about that thing that happened last night and, and, and or in their community. And so I think that's, that, that's the first thing that we can do. So the one, the one thing that I'm going to, uh, that we've already talked about as a leadership team is how do we create the opportunity, the permission, the, uh, the, the time in order for individuals to do these types of things. And it's a lot like what we had to do after the murder of George Floyd, when individuals were experiencing something and didn't know how and where to place that anger or or the energy, um, and we equip with individuals with, number one, the permission to use the time to talk about those things, but number two, some resources in order, um, and some tools in order to have those conversations. So that's number one. Number two, we want to expand what we're doing around mentoring as well. Um, and I don't think uh, Kevin was able to share some of the things that we've done around mentoring already, but to principles done point, a point that Principal Dunn made, these things take resources. So you have to, you just can't, like, you just can't say to, I, I just can't pick a person tomorrow and say, here, give these students your phone number so they can call you at any given time. These things, you, I mean, individuals have to, number one, know what they're doing, 
Number two, love children and, and want to help that young person solve a problem. Um, and, and then number three, you have to have some system in place to know who those individuals are. And oh, by the way, as Principal Dunn indicated, it can't be one for every 100 children. It has to be one for like a small number of students that, that are able to manage. We've started that now in several schools and we want to expand that but it's, we're taking, we're having to provide the resources in order to train around that. Thank, the, the second piece was, I mean, the third piece is really around the intentionality of bringing all of these groups together. So at, at a school, and I know in the school district of Philadelphia, and I'm sure at Grax as well, we have become too good, too good at responding to, like traumatic situations, sending a strike team or counselors into schools after a young person has been killed or a victim of gun violence. And that, and we, we do that immediately and those resources are there. But then those resources are short-lived and then they have to go to another place because there are, if there's another school that is impacted by uh, homicide or victims of gun violence. And then from that school, they have to go to a different place. While those young people, as Armando just described with his cousin or described earlier about his cousin, while that young person is still experiencing the trauma of that issue, we're having to send those resources from one place to the, to the next place um, because there are so many children that are being, or students that are being impacted. Um, so I, th this to me has become like the, the numbers of young people evolve, involved, and, and Kevin said it best, this is not normal. Um, the numbers of the young people who have been involved in, in, in incidents of violence, gun violence, homicides, murders, uh, that, that number, I mean, it's at an epidemic proportion. So that means we have to take very different steps, very different and intentional steps to inoculate our young people against um, hopefully be, ever becoming a victim or ever witnessing that event. And you it can inoculate them with the resources, the services, the supports, the ability to voice their emotion with a job, with access to nutrition, with access to healthcare, uh, with access to, eat, to, to activities that are during the school day, beyond the school day, to access, I mean, to opportunities like college tours, mentoring, all of those things then become a part of the inoculation of what our young people are dealing with in this epidemic. Um, and then I'd be remiss if I didn't say, and we also need to work, we also need to work downstream to solve like what's creating the balance in the first place, right? And, and I think some of what I talked about and what we've heard this evening around the inoculation of these things are really important. Uh, I'll, add, I'll end with this, and, and Amando talked about it. The other thing is we have to talk more about what we're doing to, to help ameliorate these issues. And like the communication of individuals knowing how then the district is has services available to children, to communities, to families, to adults, um, and how those resources are available and can be used um, when young people are experiencing these types of incidents. And so uh, I'll stop there because I know you're well above uh, beyond time, but uh, just wanted to add my two cents, Johan, to all of the tremendous, uh, the, the tremendous panel list that you've had this afternoon, especially at two students. No worries, Dr. Hyde. Thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight. And like I said, we do plan to share these bullet points with the new with the new school superintendent, including those very suggestions that you pointed out, Dr. Hyde. Uh, so yes, our time is up. So I want to say thank you to Dr. Hyde again, as well as this evening's panelists and our audience. You guys have been patient. You have been gracious. Um, you have been engaged and in tune with the discussion, and I'm thankful for that. I'm also thankful for you supporting our coverage at Chalkbeat. And with that, I'm saying good night and thank you. Take care. Be safe.